Hi, Rich Pickett with Personal Wings. I was about to go fly in the SoCal area here in San Diego, and I thought before I took off, I'd talk a little bit about cybersecurity and how it affects us as pilots. To give you a little quick background, uh, previously I was a computer science professor at various uh, universities, as well as chief information officer, for example, at San Diego State, and I managed cybersecurity uh, departments. So let's talk a little bit about that. One of the reasons I want to talk about it is this week, it appears that Jeppesen was hit by a ransomware or some type of hacking activity. And the way I found about it is I thought, hey, I'm gonna reload one of my cards, my data cards, and uh, with Terrain, huh? So I logged in, no Terrain in my subscription. I said, that's odd. So I logged into another account. I've got multiple ones. None of them had Terrain in their database listings. So I'm going, what's going on? Then I try to get a hold of Jeppesen, actually about 12 times through their toll-free number, their direct number, uh, support, everything. I couldn't get a hold of anybody. So this happened for a few hours, and finally I realized that something has happened to their systems. Later on, I, I read through some news organizations that it appears that they had their systems had been compromised in one way or another. So, as pilots know, or you can say like Alfred E. Newman, what, me worry? From the old Mad Magazine, the reason is we need to worry. So here you have a situation where a company that supplies databases worldwide to tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of operators, right, had issues with their database systems and the access to the database. And it appears that it happened at one of the most critical times when the new cycle came up this week. Now, I always load my database about a week before from Jeppesen through their uh, Jeppesen Distribution Manager, JDM. So for me, my issue is a little mitigated because I already had copies of everything all ready to rock. I always like to plan ahead because they come out about a week ahead. But I thought, what about all those people who said, hey, boy, this last week, money, it's, I got a few days to, uh, to do the databases. I better update my databases and then they can't get into the system. Initially, it looked like, hey, just train was impacted. Oh, okay, well, that's okay. That only is updated every four years. So unless you have a Synvis system that requires a new reload, which I was going to try on, on the citation that I fly with uh, the G1000, um, it's not a huge problem. But then I couldn't log into JDM. I went, wait a minute. Is that password correct? I have multiple accounts. I checked and verified. Nope. Some accounts I could log into. Some accounts I couldn't. It's very bizarre. Got a hold of uh, Jeppesen support, finally through a chat. And of course, they were just swamped. Took them eight hours to respond. They said, oh, your problem's resolved. Databases are all there. I'm going like, really? Went on there, no databases. Try to log into my other accounts, no login. Back to Jeppesen support chat. So, you know, I'm pretty much down in terms of being able to get new data from them. Like, but like I said, I already had uh, my databases loaded. How does that affect the pilots? So let's talk about this. I always like to have current databases in all of them, obstacles, terrain, you name it, safe taxi in, in the case of the Garmin and the NAV databases, whether I'm flying VFR or IFR, right? And you have to have them for IFR, but even for VFR, I don't want to be at, find out that my database is, in, is incorrect. So let's talk about the implications you're gonna fly. So the FAA through the Airman's Information Manual states that in route GPS databases, you can fly with them if they're expired, if you can verify your waypoints. Huh, okay. So let's say I'm gonna go from Montgomery here in San Diego, MYF up to um, Oakland, right? Okay, cool. How are you gonna verify that those points haven't changed, that that airway hasn't changed? So what you have to do then is say, okay, here's my FMS database. Here are all the waypoints for that Q route, let's say, for one of the RNAV routes. Then I have to bring up my charts and verify that each one of those is correct. As long as you can bring up your charts. You have to have current charts to do that as well. So that's the kind of catch 22. Hey, yeah, verify the database. What am I gonna verify it to? All right, so that's an issue. So there are ways around that. You can then use the government through the FAA, used to be NOS, charts and data, and you can compare 
along your route all those waypoints and verify each intersection, et cetera, et cetera, that you're using to verify it's the same one position, et cetera. Okay, phew, that's a lot of work. It's an awful lot of work. Uh, but let's say you do it. Okay, great. Now you go to your destination. You're going to land at Oakland. Okay, great. I'll bring up my charts. Oh, wait a minute. I couldn't download the current chart. Wait a minute. I don't have the current databases because I couldn't get into my system to get the new databases because that's why I had verified it verified and route. So what do I do on an approach? Well, the FAA does not let you go through and try to manually adjust any routes, any waypoints on an approach. So while in route, you can put the latitude and the longitude of any new waypoint, and that's fun to do for each one as you're going along if they've changed. If you come up to an approach, you can't manually change those approach waypoints. So if you want to do an LPV or an LNAV VNAV or just an LNAV, you have to be able to have the current database in there that reflects, or your database has to reflect the current approach that you have. So the FA does have a slight way around this so that you don't have to manually operate that. What they say is, if that approach hasn't changed from the last cycle, then you can fly that approach. How do I know that? Because I don't have my current, the new cycle of charts. I don't know what they are. So again, one way to do it, one way I suggest, is you go to the FAA charts, right? Government issued charts available on, for example, Garmin Pilot, as well as on uh, four flight wings and, and all the other companies that have the EFBs. And you look at the chart and you look at the current cycle of the chart and see if when it's issued, if the amendment date has changed with the old one that you have, that might be from Jeff. If the amendment date is the same, you're good to go. If it says, oh, we reissued that. Oh. Then you've got to go and verify that that approach hasn't changed. Now, sometimes a lot of the changes are very simple. They may be minimums. Okay, great. I'll put in the new minimums. That's easy. It may be an ATIS frequency. Great. I'll listen to the, the new ATIS or ASOS. It might be a note for the mist. Okay, those are easy. But then what you have to do is see, okay, have any of those waypoints changed? If any of the waypoints have changed since the last good approach that you know that you had the copy and the new one you can't fly that uh, GPS approach with your uh, FMS so this is a good time to be really good on your VOR approaches and ILS's because if you find out this information and you were hoping you were going to do an RNAV approach you can't do it so you're back to doing VORs uh, ILS's or even NDB's I practice NDBs occasionally, there are not very many of them anymore, <laughs> more in Mexico. But here you've got a situation that you've got to verify. So this is an example of how dependent we are on software in our aircraft, right? Whether I fly our 206 or I fly the Citations, the Premier, whatever. We now have aluminum and composite wrapping around software and hardware, electronics. That's how I like to explain it. We're simply flying through the air, software that's uh, just surrounded with seats and aluminum and plastic so that we can fly our destination. It's quite a bit different than when I first learned to fly in the 70s where everything was mechanical and I don't want to go back to that. But in that particular case, it was vacuum or electric, that's it, right? You had ground-based systems, you had VORs, so, and the receivers were very, very simple. They, they had some software, obviously, and firmware to be able to do everything, but for the most part, pretty simple. Now what we have are these incredible technology, whether it's a Rockwell Collins, ProLine 21, Fusion, Apex from Honeywell, Honeywell's other systems, whether it's uh, any of the Garmin products, any of the Aspen products and so forth, uh, just incredible opportunities are Avidine. So you've got this great capability, but we're dependent upon these electronics. So there's several things that I think that you have to, re you have to take from this. One is, Make sure you're current on what we call the green needles on the basic data. Make sure you go out and do an ILS, a VOR, even an NDB if you have an ADF. Go and do that without the aid of your FMS. 
right? Turn it off, go fly VOR to VOR. You go, what the heck is that? How do you fly that? Well, geez, you pull out a chart and you get at your VORs. If you have just one receiver, you change between the two VOR frequencies, you triangulate like we always did, and you know where you are. It's amazing how many times I fly the jets and I'm up there and there is a GPS outage and the pilots forgot to check their NOTAMs. And they're like, what happened? What happened to ATC? And ATC, well, there's a NOTAM GPS outage. Well, now what do I do? We'll fly direct to this VOR. The crews are going like, uh, 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 can you give me a heading? Because they don't know how to find those VORs quickly. So that's why it's important to always have situational awareness. Expect that your electronics are gonna fail at some point. So it's a good idea in cross countries to make sure that you dial in VORs, you know where you are, you have that situational awareness. So what we also need to do is make sure that these companies, Jeppesen, Boeing, et cetera, anybody who has the, uh, these systems that are susceptible to cyber attacks and compromise, whether it's accidental or intentional, need to make sure that their systems are stronger. There's too many times that as consumers, whether it's pilots or even consumers out there, we've had our accounts compromised. You look at the number of attacks and successful compromises on credit card, for example, with Heartland Processing, uh, you name it, Experian, et cetera. We've almost got uh, numb to the fact that we're having so many of these compromises. I was doing a cybersecurity seminar a couple of years ago and I made a presentation. And I said, do you realize everybody in here has had their accounts compromised this year alone, probably on an average of four to five times. During that year to two year period, there was 1.2 billion accounts that were compromised by hackers. So that means that somebody in the world knows everything about you, one way or another, whether they have it now or later, whether it's the Chinese or it's other actors uh, that have done this around the world for various nefarious pur purposes, you have to assume that your dad is out there. So we really need to make sure that we put pressure on companies, especially aviation companies, which we rely on, to make sure that they have robust computer systems. Just does not make any sense at all to have systems that are we rely on from a safety standpoint or economic, if you look at, for example, credit card companies and other, and other companies such as that, or social media, where uh, we just sort of become, eh, well, it's just another hack, and I'm, I'm compromised again. So think about that. Hope this helped you give you a little bit of idea of what's going on and why we are so reliant on good cybersecurity and aviation, and do whatever you can to support companies and uh, their quest to make sure we have secure systems. Let's make sure you have good passwords and that they develop robust systems to prevent these incursions. They can be prevented. There's no question. I've managed departments. We were pretty successful in keeping the hackers out on large scale systems. Doesn't mean that at some point they could be, but boy, we just did our best efforts. And so sometimes best efforts may not be enough. So we need to push companies. So I thank you for watching. If you like the video, click the like, subscribe to our channel. We also have our Personal Wings website as well as our Instagram and YouTube uh, uh, presence. And we have a lot of videos out all over the place, especially here on YouTube where Tigre, uh, our son and I have flown uh, lots of different things. We try to educate people and have fun at the same time on gyrocopters, traveling to Mexico, traveling through the Caribbean, 360 degree videos through the Caribbean that you can pan and zoom through San Diego Harbor in our clips. Uh, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, flying videos, and we'll continue to do more because we just love to do this. So have a great flight. I'm going to take off and take my 206 down and go up and do some stalls, some steep turns, maybe get a little fuel and just kind of have fun with it for a while this beautiful Saturday morning. Thanks. <laughs>